My name is Alex Holcomb. I'm a lecturer in the School of Psychology here, and I'm a council member of JAST. And tonight, our, we're very lucky to have David Eagleman here, who's um, from the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas, and where he directs the Laboratory for Perception and Action, and also Institute for Neuroscience and Law. But he's here in Sydney to actually perform at the Sydney Opera House with Brian Eno on Saturday. And he encourages you to come along to that as well. Um, and uh, what we're going to do tonight is uh, he'll be giving his lecture on the topic of synesthesia, which I think is somewhat linked to, possibly to his performance, but he might tell you a bit about that. David is a very creative thinker, not just a hard-nosed scientific one, um, which is the way I was uh, thinking about things, and he brought from neuroscience a lot of uh, exciting ideas. Now, with his synesthesia research, he's not only broken down the boundaries between visual perception and neuroscience, but also now extending into um, art and literature and maybe even music, which he also has interest in. So um, with the synesthesia research, I think um, whether you're a scientist like me or a artist or a musician or just someone who's interested in the mind, I think you'll enjoy his talk, uh, which is entitled Hearing Colors, Seeing Sounds, The Neuroscience, Behavior, and Genetics of Synesthesia. So let's welcome David. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Um, so here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the human brain, which is the most complicated device that we have found in the universe. It weighs about three pounds. It has billions of neurons that make it up. And there are so many connections in the human brain, so many synapses, that if you were to take a cubic millimeter of brain tissue, you have more connections in there than you have stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's an extremely complicated device that we're talking about. And one of the goals of modern neuroscience is to figure out how to study the brain at several different levels. So we have whole laboratories that are devoted to studying the synapse, the connection between neurons. And you can study the neurotransmitter molecules and what happens here. You can study individual neurons, which are the cells of the brain. And an individual neuron is as complicated as the city of Sydney. It's got the entire human genome in it. It's trafficking millions of proteins, secreting chemicals. It's an incredibly complicated device. So then what we look at in neuroscience is networks of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these neurons, and eventually the entire architecture of the whole human brain. And what we're trying to figure out is how all of that maps on to how you see the world. So how you see reality somehow is connected to all that wet biological gushy stuff. And the reason we know that is because if you were to lose your pinky in a terrible accident, you would be sad about it, but it wouldn't change your perception of the world. But if you lose just a little piece of your brain tissue from a stroke or a car accident or something like that, that can really change the way that you perceive reality. It can change a lot of other things, too, like your personality and your capacity for decision making. But it can affect your ability to um, see colors or understand music, things like that. So we know that somehow your reality depends on all that wet biological stuff. And the question is, is how? So that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. And one of the really strange parts that, um, <laughs> that we'll see throughout this talk is that what you call reality is actually a construction of the brain. So most of you are probably familiar with the idea that color itself is a construction of the brain. Color doesn't actually exist in the outside world. All you ever have out there is electromagnetic radiation of different wavelengths. And those strike your eye. Those strike the retina at the back of your eye. And, um, uh, and what you see is this. Your brain interprets it as something quite different. <clears throat> Um, and of course, it's clear why we have the perception of color. Evolutionarily, it turns out it's very useful because um, let's say you were a space alien who could detect the difference in electromagnetic radiation, and so you tag everything in your world with different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Well, that's one way to do it, but it turns out it's much more useful if you can have an immediate perceptual experience that we call color, and that way you can spot the fruit in the trees from a distance. So that's why we have color. Um, but it turns out that everything we think about with lightness and color and hues and saturation, 
It's a construction of your brain, and we can illustrate this with various visual illusions. So everyone would agree with me that that surface is lighter than that surface. You can see that? OK, well, it turns out it's not. So what I'd like you to do is hold out your finger and, and cover that part. So cover that part of the diagram with your finger. And what you'll see is that they're exactly the same. I'll cover it for you here to show you also. But you can do that yourself. You can do that with your own finger. Cover it up so you see I'm not pulling any tricks. And what you see is that they're exactly the same lightness. The surfaces are identical. What happens is, um, because of this gradient here, that ends up telling your brain certain information uh, about the differences in the lightness, and that spreads to these other surfaces. And so your brain ends up thinking those are different. But this is one way of illustrating that what you think about brightness is not what you, it's, it's not what you think it is. Um, here's just another example. Um, so here's a uh, chessboard with a shadow cast on it. So this square labeled A and this square labeled B, would you believe that they're actually exactly the same color as one another? It's exactly the same shade of gray. It doesn't look like it, but that has to do with the fact that this is cast in shadow here. And your brain has assumed that it's a white square, and so it sees that as different. But if I were to drop in a gray square here, what you see is that A and B are identical. There's no difference between them. Everyone see that? OK. Um, here's another example, although now you guys, now nobody's going to take this bet from me. But the, that, that middle square there and that middle square there, would anybody think that those are exactly the same, the middle squares? Well, it turns out, it turns out they are. Um, and if you cover that up, what you see is that they're exactly the same shade. What, what happens is because of all the cues that your brain gets about lighting and shadow, um, and the surrounding colors, your brain ends up interpreting those as extremely different colors, whereas in fact they're identical. So even something like color is a construction. Your brain puts together the best story that it can about what's going on out there, but that doesn't mean that's actually what's going on out there. Okay. So the point I'm getting at is that we accept the reality presented to us. Your brain constructs the story about what's going on out there, and you accept that as, as your reality. So um, for example, here's a picture I took in India. And it's a perfectly good picture, and this is how you would see the world if you're colorblind. And if you're not colorblind, then you would see it like that. And in either case, you would accept that reality. And if you were a, uh, <clears throat> if you were a, a bloodhound dog who had an extraordinary sense of smell, and at one point you stopped and thought, what would that be like to be a human with their pitiful little impoverished sense of smell? You would think, they must, they must miss all that smell. But you don't. You just accept whatever, accept whatever input you have. OK, so this all leads to a very old philosophical question, uh, which tends to come up in dorm rooms at 3 in the morning also, which is, how do you know that what I see as uh, blue is what you see as blue. In other words, <clears throat> we can all agree to call this blue, but inside your head and inside my head, it might be a different subjective experience, right? We might actually have different things going on inside of our heads. <clears throat> so this used to be a subject of, of uh, philosophical speculation about, you know, is there any way we would actually know if our internal experiences are different? Because remember, our mothers teach us to call this blue in the outside world, so it doesn't matter what's going on inside your head. It turns out the reality might be even worse than that. It may be that what I call reality and what you call reality are totally different. I, could, I might see the world completely upside down from the way that you see the world, and it wouldn't matter, right? If vision for me was something quite different from you, it wouldn't matter as long as we could agree on it in the outside world. OK, so what we've just recently been able to do is take this sort of thing from the realm of philosophical speculation to actual scientific experiment. And that's what I want to tell you about today. I want to tell you about something called synesthesia, which is a condition where people can see reality a little bit differently than you do. So you all know the word anesthesia, which means no feeling. So synesthesia means joined feeling. It's a blending of the senses. So, so it turns out that. Um, there are many forms of synesthesia, and one of the most common is having colored numbers or letters or weekdays or months. So what this would mean for this particular synesthete is that her eight triggers the experience of blue. Now, it's not a hallucination. If I write um, with black ink, I write eight on a white page, she'll say it's black ink. There's no, there's no mistaking what's going on there. But it triggers a blue experience for her, an internal experience of blue. And it's self-evidently true that eight and blue are exactly the same thing. They're just they're connected. And it's not a learned, memorized association, but it's an actual physical experience. 
Our K is purple, over Y is yellow, or Saturday is orange, or November is purple, and so on. And um, it used to be thought, when people did this sort of thing, that maybe they were just being artistic or metaphorical or poetic. But it turns out that uh, my colleagues and I over the last decade have developed a whole series of tests by which we can show that synesthesia is actually a real perceptual experience. And I'm going to tell you how we do that in just a little bit. Um, there are many different forms of synesthesia. So what I was showing you was colored letters and weekdays and months numbers, which is very common. There's also the uh, form of synesthesia where when people hear, it causes a visual experience for them. So when they listen to music, they might see colors, for example. Um, so this is a painting done by one of our synesthetic subjects who, um, this is what she sees when, when her furnace kicks on and goes whoosh like that. That's what she sees. That's physically uh, how her visual system is tickled. Um, um, one form is tasting shapes, where when people taste something, it makes them feel like they're holding something on their fingertips. So something cold or pointy or smooth, glassy, spiky, things like that. Um, a very common form of synesthesia, in fact, it turns out this one's probably the most common, is where people will perceive things like months of the year or days of the week to have specific spatial locations. So a synesthete with spatial sequence synesthesia will, will say, okay, well, March is sort of off here to the left, and April is next to it, and May is next to that. And for every month or weekday or number, things like that, they have a specific spatial location that they can identify where it seems that thing exists. And it's just self-evidently true to them that you know, February has some particular spatial location. And again, it's not a hallucination. It's not that they actually see it there. It's just that it's, it's obviously true that February would have that spatial location to them. It would be like if I asked you to imagine an apple here so you're picturing the apple there. That's got a particular location in, in, uh, re with respect to your body. And you can picture it there. You're not actually hallucinating it. But if I ask you later where the apple is, that's the spatial location it would have. So I'll come back to this and talk about that more later. It turns out that there are many, many forms of synesthesia. Uh, one group has estimated that there are 152 different forms that have been reported in the literature. Essentially, any kind of cross-blending you can imagine between the senses um, essentially has been reported at one point or another. So here's a list from my colleague Sean Day um, where this was just sort of a rough estimate he made of different forms of synesthesia and how prevalent they are uh, in a population that he was looking at. So for example, letters and numbers mapping onto colors is, is very prominent. Uh, this means weekdays and months here. Musical sounds going to colors, smells going to colors, taste going to colors. What you see is that color is the thing that's most commonly triggered in synesthesia. And I think this is because color is sort of a free extra dimension that the brain has that it can tag information with. Whereas if lots of synesthesia is triggered auditory experience, that might actually interfere with important environmental things. Color is not so important, so a lot of things tend to trigger color. Um, but what you can see is that taste, smells, sounds, uh, temperatures, emotions, kinetics, uh, kinetics, all these things can get triggered uh, in various ways in synesthesia. By the way, there's something else. I'd like to encourage you guys to ask questions during the talk. So if there's any questions you have at all, clarifications, anything like that. It turns out, with all of these things, it's completely idiosyncratic, which means for any given synesthete, um, it's just it's completely different what they have. And I'll show you many examples of this. So the, the colors that I showed earlier with the letters and the weekdays and months, for any given synesthete, it's totally different. And if you have a sister who's synesthetic, your colors will all be different from one another. Same with this. This happens to be sort of a very simple shape here, sort of an oval. but. Let's say her, her days for November, in this case, have a very particular and strange shape. And um, what you find is sisters, even in the same household, will have very different shapes, irrespective of whether they're the, the southern or the northern hemisphere. So that's a good question, but, and, and that allows me to bring up a very important point, which is the idiosyncrasy of these things. OK, so you have essentially any kind of cross-sensory blending that you can think of we found some case somewhere that has that sort of thing. And, and in a little bit, I'll tell you what's going on from the brain's point of view. But I'll just um, sort of pre-shadow that now, which is it turns out <clears throat> that what's going on in synesthesia is that neighboring areas of the brain have a little bit more crosstalk than normal. So what's going on is that there is the brain that care about, let's say, uh, letters and numbers are next to the areas of the brain that care about colors. And in the synesthete, these areas are talking to each other a little bit more than normal. OK. Um, 
Now, synesthesia is something that we call a perceptual condition. It's not a disorder or a disease and because there's no disadvantage to it, it turns out. Uh, in fact, synesthetes tend to have better memories. So if I were to tell you my phone number and you're a synesthete, you might forget some of the digits, but you think, oh, that had a really nice autumn color pattern to it. And so that would help you to reconstruct it later when you're trying to think of it. So has anyone heard the term nemonist? Does anyone know what that is? A nemonist is one of these people with these incredible memories. They just they have these untaxable memories. They can memorize long lists of nonsense words or numbers or so on. It turns out, um, as far as I can tell, every single one of these nemonists is synesthetic. In other words, what they're able to do is take things like the digits of pi, which not only do them have colors, but they also have textures and personalities and genders and sizes. They're able to take these digits, and, and as they're learning these, there's a whole story that's being told here. There's a whole landscape of texture and form, and, and um, since many of them have, have personality and gender, too, you can construct something out of it. So this is how they memorize pi to thousands of digits, whereas for those of us who are not synesthetic, it's really hard. All the numbers are sort of like one another. Um, I use, to, to show the memory thing, this is, this is funny. I'm actually using one synesthetic example here. Uh, these are the colors he sees for Mike and Dan, but it turns out that he runs into trouble at cocktail parties sometimes because it just so happens that Dave and Rob have exactly the same colors for him as Mike and Dan, and so if your name's Dan, he's pretty likely to mess you up and call you Rob later in the night, and that's why. Okay, um, in, in honor of the Luminous Festival that's going on, I thought I'd mention some stuff about musical synesthesia. Um, so <clears throat> it turns out that for many people, different notes of the scale will trigger color experience. Uh, so here's, here's one synesthete uh, that I've tested in the lab. So for her, when she hits the note A on the piano, that's pink, B is blue, C is goldish white like sunlight, D is silvery white like moonlight, fiery orange, and so on. And so they're very specific colors that get triggered when she hears specific notes like this. Um, for some people, uh, musical intervals, like a chord, will trigger very particular tastes in the mouth. So uh, for different chords, there's a different, there's a different taste in the mouth. And uh, in, a, in a Nature paper recently, a musician reported that you know, she uses these synesthetic associations to identify the chord. And in fact, I know a drum tuner, a professional drum tuner, who goes around for all the famous rock and roll bands and, and tunes their drums. And he does it with colors. So, so he can tell if the drum is a little bit sharp or flat by the color that he's seeing in response to the sound. Um, instrument timbre also has, has influence on color. So when somebody's listening to a violin versus a tuba versus a cello and so on, the timbre of the instrument can trigger very different experiences. Um, so here, here are two, uh, two different subjects describing the shapes that they see in relation to, uh, in response to different sorts of instruments here. So uh, the cello, this person sees as a flat horizontal bass with spring-like vertical protrusions, and this person sees it as a thick ribbon, and so on. And so uh, it's not only colors and textures, but it's also forms that can be triggered by these things. Um, and it can get more complicated. So the uh, genders and personalities can be involved. So for, um, you know, oboe is profoundly emotional and thoughtful, withdrawn, introspective, and prone to melancholy. Flute is feminine, sweet, innocent, naive, and so on. So there are very rich descriptions that can come out of how people perceive the gender and the personality of different instruments. Um, and here, this is the same synesthete who I was showing the colors for her notes before. Um, um, with, with, different, with different bass lines, the, uh, this woman will feel like her body is in a different position. So she feels like she's standing upright with her feet on the ground or, or stepping on a stair or soaring high in the sky and so on, depending on the functional harmony. Yeah, there's a question here. Great question. What percentage of the population has synesthesia? It used to be thought that it was very rare. It used to be thought that it was something like 1 in 20,000. We now know that it's at least 1% of the population, maybe as high as 4% of the population has synesthesia. It can be. There are several cases in the literature now uh, where people acquire synesthesia after a car accident or a stroke. So it's a great question. So the question is, is it bidirectional? If your eight is blue, will blue trigger eight? The answer is no. It's only unidirectional. And uh, in part, this is because you might have several letters or numbers that all map onto the same color blue. And so blue doesn't seem to trigger anything in the backwards direction. Great question. <laughs> 
So it's part of the way that we test for synesthesia has to do with the consistency. So if you're a synesthete who sees eight as green, you're always going to see it as green. And, and this is, in fact, uh, I'll get to this in a little bit, but this is how we test for synesthesia. So because if, if I were to ask you to make up some colors right now, and then I were to ask you again in a year from now, if you're not synesthetic, you wouldn't be able to get the same colors. But if you are, it'll be the same. So <clears throat> it turns out that many artists have synesthesia. So for example, Kandinsky was a music to color synesthete, and so he would turn on the radio and blast the music, and he would paint what he was seeing. Um, so this was, his, uh, this was his rendition of his synesthetic experience. Uh, I don't know what the piece of music is here. Um, David Hockney is also a synesthete, um, and uh, again with music. So he listens to music and he paints the colors that he's seeing as a result of the music. Um, there are many writers who are synesthetes. So Nabokov uh, was very synesthetic with letters of the alphabet and numbers. So these would trigger color for him. And as a young man, he wrote quite a bit of poetry about this, about his vowels and how he saw them. And um, he was also a lepidopterist. He loved butterflies. And he, one of his favorite was a butterfly that was yellow, black, yellow on the wing. And so his novel, Ada, ADA, if anyone knows that novel, that, that for him is yellow, black, yellow. Those are the colors of the novel. That was his little inside lepidopterist joke, <laughs> synesthesia. Yeah. Um, and so I thought I'd mention a few other musicians since, uh, since there's a musical festival going on. So Amy Beach, if anyone knows her, um, she was synesthetic also. And so <clears throat> her biographer noted that for her, C was white, F, F sharp was black, E yellow, G, and so on. Until the end of her life, she associated these colors with those keys. And uh, maybe some of you have heard of Olivier Messiaen. He was synesthetic, and he described his purpose as painting the visible world in sound. And he would describe things in his diary and so on, like the gentle cascade of blue-orange chords. This was the, uh, the, the way he would describe particular cascades. And uh, there was even an academic paper written about his correspondence between color and sound. <clears throat> um, and when we look at the list, what we find are lots of musicians with synesthesia, uh, even in the popular scene. And it turns out <clears throat> people have speculated because of this sort of thing that maybe you have an overrepresentation of synesthetes in the artistic community. We don't actually know if that's true because nobody's ever gone in and tested the accountant community or the deep sea diver community or something. But, but what we do know is there are a lot of artists who are synesthetic. And so maybe there is, maybe there is some pull there. If you have this rich sort of reality, um, maybe you gravitate towards certain sorts of professions. Um, <clears throat> For any of you who, who know about Scriabin, um, he was very interested in the effects of putting sound and color together. He thought that would be a really strong resonator for the listener. And so what he did is he invented a color organ where when you hit the notes, you're not only playing the, the musical sound, but there are big spotlights of color coming out the top also. It turns out um, he, he actually wasn't synesthetic himself, but he was influenced by, by some fashions. And so, this was, so not everybody who does this sort of thing is actually a real synesthete. Synesthesia is a term that's also part of the artistic community and the, the, in the poetry community and the art and music community as a, as a style, a technique. So 